Hi, everyone, and welcome to lecture three of ECE 3311, Principles of Communication Systems. So this lecture is quite exciting because we're building upon lectures one and two. Um, first of all, the concept that we have uh, these functions between the information source and information sink that transform that information into electromagnetic signals, electromagnetic waveforms. And then afterwards, um, like with the content from lecture two, this idea that we have a time domain representation and we have a frequency domain representation. So this lecture will leverage both the two previous lectures in terms of helping our understanding of a communication system in terms of the frequency representation. We'll use the Fourier transform in a way that instead of looking at everything from a time domain perspective, we can also understand the communication system from a frequency perspective, right? So in this lecture, we're gonna look at things like for instance, um, um, the functions like the autocorrelation function, power spectral density. We saw the energy spectral density. We're gonna look at power spectral density. And then on top of that, we're going to look at LTI, or linear time invariant systems, which we usually model many of the components of a communication system. And einstein wiener kinchin theorem, or EWK. Right? So let's get started. So first of all, we saw, okay, in, in, uh, in lecture two, this concept of the energy spectral density, right? And then when we integrate from minus infinity to infinity, of the energy spectral density, we get the energy, the total energy of the signal. That's so awesome. But what happens, okay, if that signal, right, the, the, the density of that signal in the frequency domain, okay, is not bounded from minus infinity to infinity. So let's say that energy, like if we integrate, if we try and sum or integrate the entire frequency domain of that signal, it blows up. It's not bounded. Well, that's a problem, right? Um, so what we do, okay, is we use a concept called power spectral density, right? And the definition is shown here in equation one, right? The power spectral density almost, almost, almost looks the same as the energy spectral density, except that, uh, so let's say we have a Fourier transform. And like, so let's suppose we have a time domain function wt right and we we take the fourier transform of that and then we want to find uh, what is the energy of that well it's going to blow up it's going to blow up partly because first of all wt uh, potentially could stretch from minus infinity to infinity and then we take the fourier transform of that and then um, if we try and find the energy of that or energy spectral density and then we integrate it find the energy well it all goes to heck right so what power spectral density does is this little trick with respect to um, this limit here. Limit from a period t goes to infinity of the magnitude squared of the frequency representation of wt of f uh, divided by the period t or this time, time interval t. And you might say, well, what, what, what does this mean? Okay, so let's, let's go into this. So let's. So what this is what this means. So let's say the power spectral density of W of F is equal to the limit of T goes to infinity, right? Of W over T. Correct. So far, so good. All right. Now, um, you might say, okay, big deal. Like that, that's, that's really not that helpful. Um, just regurgitate. So, all right, but let's take a step back. So first of all, we have this relationship. Okay, so this guy, okay, is the Fourier transform of this time domain function, W t of t. Now, 
uh, what the heck is that? Well, W, okay, so let's suppose we're given W of T. And W of T stretches from minus infinity all the way to plus infinity. Uh, that's not so good, right? Because now we take the Fourier transform of that, um, and this creates a lot of problems. We're, we're going to have a problem where things are not bounded, it explodes, we can't analyze it. We, we don't know what the energy or the power is across any of this. So this is the trick we do. So suppose we define this little w of t, and it's equal to w of t and, ah, oh, this is the beauty of, of it all. So we take this fella, and what we do is we now take the rectangular function. We do that. What does that mean? So suppose that that's your W of T. And, it, and this is the time in uh, time, uh, time axis. Uh, and it goes, and it's non-zero all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, that's great, but problematic. What this trick does, so let's say we find time index zero, is I multiply that by the rectangular function. So from minus t over two, to t over two. So what you end up getting is now your w of t of t looks like this. It's about, it basically, it has an abrupt stop here, in here, and it's zero outside of it. Then if you take the Fourier transform of this, things begin to look a little bit nicer, right? Everything's more confined. We don't have things that blow up. We now start getting power values that are finite, right? Like, uh, so what ends up happening is this is actually kind of a really nice property, right? So now, um, this is great, but here's the problem. Uh, where is it? So this and this are not equal to each other, not in, not in the least, right? Because the thing is, one goes from minus infinity to infinity and the other one does not. So that's where the limit comes in. So now suppose, uh, that's a boo-boo. Now suppose I move these things to the limit of minus infinity to infinity. So I begin to go, so what I eventually do is this eventually, it approaches that. And then what I do is I propagate that limit through into the frequency domain and ultimately into the calculation of the power spectral density. So that's, so that's what we're trying to pull off here. So this idea, okay, of, of, like, uh, of like making T go to infinity, the goal is what I'm trying to do is essentially create a finite time window that eventually spans the entire time axis, right? Sounds crazy, but mathematically it's sound. So that is what the power spectral density is, right? So the power spectral density, what it does is this is the frequency representation of WT of T, right? The time domain waveform. 
that it has a finite window that is non-zero and the rest of it's zero. And now what I'm doing is I'm making that window stretch from minus to infinity. And what happens is, um, I don't, like my Fourier transform doesn't care about like minus to infinity. It says, okay, focus on this WT of T. Take the Fourier transform. Now I have the Fourier transform of that. Then I take the magnitude squared of that. Okay, great. Then I normalize this by that, the width of that time window, and I let the time window, like as that t, the size of the time window, go to infinity. So effectively, I'm going to try and make this ultimately look like as though I'm taking the Fourier transform and then taking the magnitude squared of w of t. Right? And that is the power spectral density. Super powerful concept. Because what this does is it makes no assumption on what W of T is. It's not a finite duration, time domain waveform. Rather, it could be infinite. But this formulation allows us to still find what the frequency representation is, what the power spectral density of this is. Super awesome. All right? So now, there's another factor, right? So even, so another trickaroo, because you might say, okay, Wiglinski's crazy, right? Um, I'm not going to evaluate limits in this class. And you would be absolutely right. I don't want you to evaluate limits in this class either, right? Remember, engineers do for 10 cents what everybody else for, does for a dollar. What's the trick? This is the trick. The trick is there's something called an autocorrelation function. What effectively it does is you take a function, right, or a waveform, let's say wt, you take that function, you shift it by a time amount, right, let's say tau, and you multiply together. What that effectively does is you're kind of doing like a comparison. You're evaluating its similarity at that time shift tau. And now imagine you do this for all tau, for all time shifts, right? So at tau one, you're comparing the signal against itself. So take the signal, take a shifted version of itself, multiply. Okay, at tau one, do it again for tau two, do it again for tau three, do it again for tau four, and you do it across all tau. That is what we call autocorrelation. The maximum autocorrelation, what value is it? Tau equals zero. The function with itself with no time shift should produce the maximum autocorrelation because it should be 100% identical to itself, right? And so that's what equation four represents. E, the expectation function, we're not gonna look at too many random functions here. So I use E, it's the average. So we're not, again, we're not, I, I rather not, we go into the details of what E, the expectation operator, a function is here. Um, but what we're effectively doing is we're taking the average across all these shift, 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 shift for, for all tau, right? Uh, but we won't go into like the probabilistic stuff, right? It will all be deterministic. Now, super important is this concept. Like, I mean, major walk away from this lecture is something called the einstein wiener kinchin theorem, or EWK, which means that if I take the Fourier transform of equation four, instead of having to evaluate equation one to find the power spectral density, if I take the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation, I get the power spectral density. <laughs> totally awesome. Who wants to do a limit, right? So that is a major walk away. Memorize equation five, okay? Big, big, big walk away, right? And so the other thing, why is EWK so important? Because it's what we're gonna talk about next. So first of all, if you don't remember what linear time invariant systems are, okay? So what linear time invariant systems are is if we have, okay, if we have a system, 
right? So if, let's say we have h of t. We have input x of t and y of t, or any, any sort of operator, right? So, so like I'm going to call it um, mu, 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 mu. So let's just say some function that's applied to an input. Um, let's see. So I could call it h of t, right? Um, and h of t convolves with x of t to produce y of t. But let's say we have like some sort of operator. So I'm going to call it, let's say, linear operator, right? So if I have some sort of box, I put an input x of t and I have an output y of t. So if I have the linear operator of let's say input x1 of t plus x2 of t. So I put two inputs simultaneously. And let's say they're scaled by a1 and a2. I should get at the output a scaled a1 y1 of t. So the corresponding output of the system y1 to an input x1. And then it's scaled by a1 plus a2 y2 of t. Wow. So it's almost like, just as an aside, y1 of t is equal to the linear operator of x1 of t. And y2 of t is equal to the linear operator of x2 of t. Cool beans. More important about the time invariance. So let's say I shift the inputs. Whoop. And I do a1 x1 t minus, uh, I'm going to put uh, t naught plus a2 x2 t minus t naught. You know what I'm going to get? a1 y1 t minus t naught. I'm going to get the identical shift at the output for both of them. absolutely spectacular. So LTI is huge. We're going to be taking advantage of it. And here's the reason why it's so important. So knowing that, let's say, some block in a communication system does that. Let's suppose we represent an entire receiver as a linear operator. What ends up happening is, first of all, I mentioned h of t. And if I take the, so that's the impulse response of let's say a box in my receiver. It could be a filter, could be some sort of mapping function, who knows? Um, the Fourier transform of that. So if h of t is the impulse response of that box, then the Fourier transform of that gives something called the transfer function, h of f. And so when you combine LTI and EWK, you get this really cool relationship. And this is what that relationship looks like. So suppose I have this box. So this is the impulse response, right? So if, let's say I take the Fourier transform of h of t, that's my impulse response. What do I get? I get h of f. I get the transfer function. Let's suppose I have an input x of t, and I have a y, output y of t. OK, cool. Now, suppose that I want to find out what is the power spectral density, the PSD, of the output. P, Y of F. How do I do that? And, so, and the thing is, I don't know what is Y of T. I have no clue what the time domain representation of Y of T is. But I know what X is. This is no. What do I do? First thing, I find out what the autocorrelation of X is. 
Then, using EWK, so first find auto core, auto core. Then, take the Fourier transform. I now get the power spectral density of this guy. Then, what I do is I use this all important relationship, which is, remember, assuming this is LTI, PY of F is going to be equal to the magnitude squared of H of F, the transfer function, times PX of F. So the power spectral density of the input times the magnitude squared of the transfer function gives me the power spectral density at the output, as long as that transfer function's LTI. Perfect. So let's do an example. This is huge. So EWK is huge. This is also huge. So put like put stars, put markers, put whatever to get your attention. This is important. So let's do a problem. Okay. So suppose uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to find out what is the PSD. This is an example. I want to find out what the PSD is of W of T equals A sine 2 pi F naught of T. <sighs> sine. Plus, let's suppose I have an LTI system. H of T is equal to 4 F naught sync. Remember that sync function 2 pi 2 F naught T. Remember that the Fourier transform of that is going to be equal to pi, big pi, right? Capital pi. So it's a rectangular function for um, shucks. Just messed up there. Boop. For F naught. Okay. And, and what does this look like? rectangular function from minus 2 F naught to 2 F naught, centered at zero. So that's what your H of F looks like. Okay, cool. So what I want to do is, first of all, first, find R, W, tau. So we use the definition. So the definition says, Okay, so so far so good. We got that. Um, now, now here's the fun part. Uh, what we need to do, uh, I, I, what I said about limits, I lied. We kind of need to still use them. So what we need to do here is we need to evaluate, uh, like again, the, the, this, this guy here goes from minus infinity to infinity. Sign doesn't stop at like a finite value. It just goes bzzz, all the way forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So what we do is we do the following. We take the limit of t goes to infinity, 1 over t, and we integrate, right? We're taking the average from minus t over 2 to t over 2, and we're literally evaluating the definition here. And we get that. Now, time to plug in values. So what do we do? Let's apply the definition. So that means I have limit, t goes to infinity. Uh, what is it? 1 over t. One over, uh, so t over, minus t over 2, t over 2. And now let's plug it in. Sine, uh, what is it? 2 pi f naught of t, correct? And then sine 2 pi f naught of t plus 2 pi f naught of tau because it's shifted by tau. Okay, awesome. dt. Ah, so here's another tool you're going to need to use a lot in this class. We're going to have to use a trig identity. 
and the trig identity we need to use. And it's in the course Canvas site, so check it out. There's a list of trig identities that you can use. It's going to be equal to half cosine a minus b minus half cosine a plus b. So if we apply the definition, what do we get? So we get, um, I'm going to uh, shorten this a tiny bit. First of all, we're going to take the half out. And we have 1 over t. We have the limits of integration. Brackets. We're going to have cos. Um, uh, blah, 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 we're going to have 2 pi f naught tau. And we're going to have cos 2, 2 pi f naught of t plus 2 pi f naught of tau. And then integrate with respect to t. That, my friends, is critical for integrating with respect to t. So pay attention here. Is there anything integrating with respect to t there? No. So we can actually move that out. So what we get, 1 over 2, 1 over t. And what we end up getting is cosine 2 pi f naught of tau integrate from minus t over 2 to t over 2 dt and minus we have and this is kind of not good this is kind of a messy 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 uh, derivation all right so now let's start evaluating what's this if you evaluate it what you end up getting is cos 2 pi f naught of tau, and then it's going to be t over 2 minus minus t over 2, which is that. Not, not a problem. Here, this is going to be kind of bad. This is going to be a problem. What this is going to look like, if you integrate it, is it's going to look like um, mu, 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 mu. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I forget a variable? Yeah, silly goose, that's me. Uh, I forgot A. So folks, don't forget about the A. Actually, it's A squared because it's sine times sine. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I'm going to make that correction. Sorry. Yep, A squared, A squared. Just want to be consistent. All right, so here, this is going to be a bad one. This is going to be sine 2 times 2 f naught t. Right? So far, so good because we're integrating with respect to time. And then this is going to be 2, 2. Whoop. Right? So far, so good. And then uh, what we do is we we do the we we um, we evaluate this and what we see right so so let's let's actually start evaluating limits of integration here so what happens is for this fella this big t and that big t cancel each other out so then if you take the limit as t goes to infinity oh wait a minute this has zero dependency on t. So what we get here is a squared over 2 cosine 2 pi f naught of tau. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So now let's go to this limit of integration. This is going to be fun. So this is going to be equal to a squared over 2. I'm going to bring that t underneath.
And what ends up happening is when I actually plug it in and evaluate the limit, what I'm effectively getting here, okay, and you could work this out at home, is I'm getting this. I'm getting a sine x over x, and what is that equal to? Zero. So what we could effectively do here is this goes to zero. So what's the answer at the end of the day? The answer is my R of W tau, <coughs> excuse me, is gonna be A squared over two cos, uh, too fast, cos two pi F naught of tau. That's my autocorrelation function. Power spectral density is the Fourier transform of that. Now, which is the Fourier transform of a squared over two, a constant, cosine two pi F naught of tau. Now, out of just plain laziness, not just kidding, I'm not lazy, but uh, what we know, all right, is uh, we, we know that from, um, uh, you know, if we look at the Fourier transform table, what is the Fourier transform of a cosine function? It's going to be two deltas. It's going to be a delta at minus F naught, and it's going to be a delta at F naught. So using tables, so use Fourier transform pairs. Okay, this will look like the following. It's gonna be a squared over four delta F minus F naught plus delta F plus F naught. Try this at home, all right? So spectrally, what does this look like? So P W of F looks like this, a squared over four, a squared over four at minus F naught and F naught. Now, um, remember that all important thing, P Y, the output is equal to the magnitude squared H of F squared and the input power spectral density. Uh, 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 this is W. Very, very important. Now, we know what this is, right? That's this guy. Uh, F two, no, four F naught, if I remember correctly. Boop, boop, yep, here we go. That, boop, boop, boop. All right, what does that look like? Looks like this. Uh, color. That is HF magnitude squared because we know that this is gonna be of height one from minus two F naught to two F naught. And what's square of one is one. What's the product of something, in this case, these two things, against something that has that type of response is going to be that thing. So therefore, the power spectral density of the output is going to be equal to A squared over four, delta F minus F naught plus delta F plus F naught. happy face. All right. So this again is one great example of many, many, many uh, sort of evaluations that you would do in a communications course where you would have autocorrelation functions, you would have power spectral densities, you would have um, einstein weiner kinchin theorem relationships and LTI systems. So the main walkaways from, from today's lecture, lecture three, okay, lecture three, 
EWK, LTI, okay, uh, and EWK plus LTI. Super important. Oh, oh, oh. And that's that's what I just showed. So, oh, sorry. There we go. So that that is super important. So with that, that concludes lecture three of ECE 3311.